So on the count of three, I want everybody in the whole world that's watching, give the Lord the biggest shout of praise that exists on this planet. Come on. One, two, three. My God, my God, before you sit down and those that are watching, can you zoom that camera in right here? Is this the cute, this is our, this is the keyboard player that sits behind the keyboard player. Whatever they do, I have no idea. But it's the cutest thing in the world because her son is working with her today. Do you play in keyboards with mom? Hit one of those keys. Let me see you hit one. Just hit any one you want. Just hit a key. Hit a key. Go ahead. Play something. No, go ahead. Just hit like this. Look, look, look. Oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> Look at his hair. Oh, my gosh. Come here. Come here, little man. Come here. Look at this little guy. No, okay, forget it. When, it's, when you're not all out here, he hangs with me and we play. But that's right. He's scared of the people. Okay. Go, go sit down. Have fun. I'll give you some gum later. <laughs> Speaking of sitting down, please take your seats. Let's get ready to be blessed today. Uh, well, a friend of mine... A friend of mine uh, sparked a, the opening of today's message. I want you all to hear this. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but today is St. Patrick's Day, and um, so I did a little study on St. Patrick, and, you know, St. Patrick around the world being Italian, the Irish, it's their day to dig the Italians, and it's the Italians to dig back because they're both so arrogant. I'm not wearing green, I'm Italian. Even Dave Walton sent me a text this morning and says, on St. Patrick's Day, everybody's a little Irish except the Italians. They stay Italian. <laughs> and, he, and he says to me, he goes, is this true? <laughs> I'm like, it is. I'm teasing. So St. Patrick's Day is a day of Let's go to the bars, let's get drunk, let's wear green, let's worship shamrocks, let's just, let's just make it a day of partying. And then I thought, there's got to be something more to this guy, Patrick. So I looked him up, studied him a little bit, and Patrick, Patrick was taken captive by barbarian Irish pirates when he was 16 years old. So at 16 years old, this man was taken captive, taken away from his family, and imprisoned by Irish pirates, and he was he was in prison for six years. After six years, he had this vivid dream or a vision, he doesn't know what it was, that the Lord showed him an escape route where he could escape and be free again. So he woke up, he took the route he saw in the vision, and he became a free man. But only long enough to become a priest and a minister he wasn't really a Christian when he was in captivity, but he became one. He became a believer in Jesus, and he became a priest, and then afterwards, he went back to the very place where they, captive, where they captured him because he had a heart for the people, and he began to minister the gospel to the people of this pagan nation. Now, the pagan king didn't like that very much, so he fought, but St. Patrick, or Patrick, fought even harder. The funny thing is about St. Patrick is we call him St. Patrick, but he was never commissioned a saint by the, by the Catholic Church, and actually, he actually said, um, I'm going to quote if I can find what I, what I actually wrote here, he said um, in his biography that he is the greatest sinner of all sinners. So he didn't ever look at himself as a saint, he looked at himself as a sinner trying to do God's work. So now... He persists with the pagan king, and the pagan king fights back, but after a while, he converted the king to Christianity, got him baptized, and once the king was baptized, all the people in the nation began to be baptized, and he took what was called a shamrock or a three-leaf clover, and he used it to demonstrate and witness the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. So he took this three-leafed shamrock, which was on one stem, it grew out of one stem, and out of the one stem was the Father, was the Son, and was the Holy Spirit. St. Patrick was probably single-handedly one of the people that have made Ireland a Christian nation as it is today. And while he was there, see, he didn't dress up in green, and he didn't believe in leprechauns, and he didn't, he didn't go to bars and drink green beer or watch green dye be poured into the to the, uh, one of the lakes in Chicago, he literally ministered like Paul did. 
with his life being threatened from time to time. And this is what he ministered. This is what Patrick pushed. He didn't push himself. He pushed the word of God. And he taught all the people of Ireland this, what he calls it a so-called prayer, but it's more, of a, it's more of a saying or a proclamation. He said, Christ with me, Christ before me. Christ behind me, Christ in me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me. Christ on my right, Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit up. Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. And Christ in every ear that hears me. So, if you want to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, do it like St. Patrick did, <laughs> and go get somebody saved. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. People right now watching this are pouring their green beer out as we speak. <laughs> I can't do this now if he did all that for me. All right. So, I uh, take that, and I'm going to segue right into my message today. And the message today that I want to talk about is I've been watching disaster happen on social media. And I think social media, the enemy means it for harm, but God will somehow turn it around and make it good. But I just want to help people understand where we need to go as Christians and what we actually need to do regarding this thing called social media. I'm, I'm tired of hearing young people uh, commit suicide. I'm, I'm just tired of people falling in traps and being hurt and and. What are we going to do? What are we really going to do? Well, I think if we go back to the Word of God, just like we go back to the origin of who St. Patrick is, I think we can get a better understanding of what we need to do. It's just whether we do it or not. It's up to you. So we cannot eliminate evil from society. We just can't do it. We're not going to eliminate. We are not going to eliminate evil from society. There will always be bullies. There will always be darkness trying to get those who are weak and those who are strong. That's just the way it is. So don't look at you trying to be the Savior and eliminate all evil in the world. You're not going to be the one to make world peace, and you're not going to be the one to eliminate evil. Yes, I am. Okay, keep believing that. Because the Lord says he does it all but he uses us as an extension of who he is. So keep listening. So when social media displays how young people are so successful and happy, and it displays how they are achieving what others want to, but they can't. So basically, social media, when young people look at social media, and not just young people, but people our age as well, in their 30s, they, they look at social media, what? Stop it, stop it. They look at, <laughs> how dare you? They... <laughs> They look at social media, and they look, young people look at it, and so do we. We look at social media, and you're looking at these people who are, oh, their whole life is perfect right there. And everything in their life at that very moment, that is a ray of perfection. And they snap it, post it, and think you, make you believe that their whole life looks like that. So it, it's, I mean, you're like, Joe, we already know that. Yeah, do you? Because when you look at something, you're like, I can't stand looking at that person. They're always so happy. You know, if they are happy for that moment. But that's not how they live their life every day, you see, and you need to understand that. So basically, they don't, uh, they don't know that most of what is posted in the moment and not really true, but it appears that everyone but you has it together. Everybody but you has it together on, on social media. Everybody, whether it's a twit, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, it doesn't make a difference. Why does everybody have it together except me? What did you say? Well, people that believe tweet, tweets are twits. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. Jesus, help me. So this is misunderstood information that can cause young people and not so young people to make inaccurate decisions based on themselves. This is where I'm just starting this at today. We're going to get to the Word of God. Hopefully, you're going to absorb this and take hold of this. Before social media, we really didn't know what was going on in the block next door to us. We had no clue what was going on across the street. We didn't know what was going on in another state. You had to go, you had to pick up a newspaper or, or read a magazine to find out what celebrity did this or what person did that or who got this or that. You didn't have a clue. Now it's at the blink of your eye. Literally, it's the blink of your eye. And so I sit here and I say, people on social media... They can portray themselves in any way that they want. See, if the world doesn't like you, you can make the world like you by telling them what you want them to believe. Yeah. Only problem is, is people actually believe it, and so do you. But it's not true. 
Because if you don't have the truth, then the false will come and overtake you. So keep listening. You know. Let me just finish. I, I wrote this. I'm, I'm reading because I don't I want to get through it fast. But they portray themselves any way that they want to. I want you to see them. And that preys on those who are not feeling secure about themselves. So when you are bombarded with that much half-truth positivity, which appears to you as negativity, and you have no one around you to help you possess this information, excuse me, process this information, you are headed for destruction. So all this is around you, and so many young people are absent of of adult supervision and young people. I'm not saying that people have to watch over you, tell you what time to come home, tell you what time to go to bed. I'm talking about supervision when your mom or your dad comes up to you and says, don't believe this about you. When, when I was young and my dad, my dad helped me get out of OCD. When I was 10 years old, I had OCD. I had to do everything three times. Flip on light switches three times. Everything I did was three times. And if I did it three times and it didn't go right, then I had to do it three times, three times. Can you see where I, sometimes I could never leave the room? Three times, three times, three times. I don't know why I did it. I thought God would be mad at me if I didn't complete his trinity. You think I'm joking. That's how my little brain thought at nine and ten years old. So one day my dad saw me. My dad saw me. My dad did what a parent is supposed to do. And he came up to me and he goes, what are you doing? I said, nothing, nothing. He says, why you turn that light off so many times? I go, I don't know. He goes, do you think something bad will happen if you do? I said, mm-hmm. He goes, well, it won't. Last time I ever did it just because my dad decided to tell me what truth was. We need to understand truth, people. We need to understand that social media is not truth. People love to post their new cars on social media. Look what I just bought. You got to pay for it. Why don't you post in three months now? Tell us how you're doing. You see what I'm saying? So there's nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying don't believe that everything is perfect and you're the one falling apart. So, so now, what we can do is pour into our young people the absolute truth regarding their self-worth. What we can do is pour into each other the absolute truth of our self-worth. Amen? So I want you to understand this. I want, I'm going to put this up here so you can snap a picture of it and read it all the rest of your life. Whether you're young as in age or, or just old, you need to get to this understanding. And I don't mean just old like old. I mean, I mean well, I mean old, so old. <laughs> this is what you have to remember. Put that up there. Put my, my blue yellow up there. You don't change who you are. And God doesn't change how he created you and how he sees you. The world around you does. So don't buy the lie. Yeah. Amen. Amen? This is the stuff I think of while I'm falling asleep at night. That keeps me up. You don't change you. You can't change you. You say, but yes, I can. I can better myself. You can't change. God already made you perfect. You can't change you because you didn't change you the wrong way. The world changed you. God doesn't change you because he created you perfect the first time. He doesn't change, change who you are, and he doesn't change how he sees you. There's nothing you can do to make, you, make him love you less. There's nothing you can do. that he, there is not, If God looked at you, he can't say, there's nothing I can put in that person to make them better. I've made them perfect already. But the world around you changes you, changes how you think, changes how you speak, change, changes what you do, changes how you live. And when the world around you changes it, you begin to buy the lie and you begin to be transformed as how they see you rather than how God sees you. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm just, I'm just building this a little bit. So we need to bombard people, young people especially, young people, old people, all people, with the love of Jesus and that he has for you, that he has for me, that during the hard times, the times that joy just seems to be an impossible task, Jesus is still with us. He's there to help us. He's there to keep us going. It's when you push past the moments of despair that continue your journey to joy and peace that cannot be taken from you by anyone. You have to push past the moments of despair. You say, Joe, this sounds like a motivational message. It is till I get to the scriptures because I'm going to back up everything I just said with Jesus. So now watch this. You've heard this before. It takes a village to raise a child. How many people have heard that? Yep, me too. Okay, so we all play a part in equipping children for life. And since so many people in our generation's past have failed to raise us and equip the children 
We have to bring the adults back to a childlike place where they can be blessed by God and not attempt to succeed in every way on their own abilities. So your parents, parents, somewhere down the line, somebody failed to raise you. Somebody failed to tell you this right here. Somebody decided to tell you what was important in this world, but it wasn't this. And therefore, it got you so out of whack that now we have to bring the childlike back to the aged. We have to bring the word to the child. We can no longer let a gap or a cavern bridge us between humanity and success because it eliminates God. We can't eliminate God anymore. You have to include him. Trust me when I tell you this. You can't eliminate God in your process in life. You literally have to include him. Amen? And we have failed to do that to our children. We have failed to do it. We have failed to do it to adults. We have failed to do it to each other. We have just failed, and we decide to tell people how to accomplish life through the basis of our ability and what worked for us. Amen? Worked for us, meaning in business, success. I'm not talking about biblical. We need to get back to Bible. So there is something that the Lord says, and I titled this message today, Reclaim. It is time to reclaim what God gave us. It is time to reclaim it, and it is time to teach our young people. We are going to raise a generation that does not have to deal with the garbage that we are dealing with right now, or we're going to let them continue to raise themselves. We're going to be raised by the Word of God, and if not, we'll just continue to be raised by ourselves. because at any age, when you raise yourself, you fail. Yeah. Amen? So, when... Uh, uh, I just want to know, why have we not done what God has commanded us to do? Not asked us to do what he commanded us to do. We haven't done it. But I will tell you this, as I'm reading, the, if I'm, I'm reading all these scriptures that I'm about to embark on right now, I just want to let you know that it's never too late because he will replace what the locusts have stolen. He will replace right now, just like that. As soon as your mind conceives it, understands it, and, and begins to commit to it and move forward, he will bless you. So let's go on with this. I'm going to start with a psalm, uh, Psalm 78, which has literally rang in my life throughout my entire life, especially my ministry for the last 25 years. Psalm 78, starting with verse 1, it says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old. What that means is I will teach you what we know about God and what we have heard about God, but there is so much that we can't even conceive the fullness of God, but we're going to continue to give you everything we know. This is what he's talking about right here. So in verse 4, it says, we will not hide them from our children. Whoa, this is what we're doing. We're not only hiding them from our children, the world is hiding the truth from us. Why is nobody understanding this? Somebody say amen. Okay, the world is hiding the truth from us. We're all about, listen, we, we, we yearn for emotions, we yearn for feelings, we yearn for touch, we yearn for, but we, what is the truth? What is the truth? What's the truth, Rock? I'm afraid. For the first time in my life, I'm afraid. I'm oh, sorry, that was Rocky Three. Verse 3 says, <laughs> which we have heard and known and our forefathers have told us. Verse 4 says, we will not hide them from our children, telling to the generation to come the praises of our Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded. Somebody say commanded commanded our forefathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generations to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may, they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the faithful works of God, but keep his commandments. Now, how many people sit down with their family, with your children, with each other, whatever age you are, and you talk about the goodness of God? Not, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really shake you up a little bit here. Not what God has presently done for you, because people will look at you and try to rebel on what you're saying. God did this for me. Yeah, I don't believe it. Okay, because we're in a not believing world. But how many actually sit down with your family and begin to discuss the goodness that has been recorded in the word of God that we, history can prove? 
This is where you grow. You grow when you look back and you go, oh my God, look what he did. Oh, 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 look what he did. But he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look what he's not did, but look what he's doing. So how can you try to engage God to do something if you don't ever reflect back on what he did? I was at church the other day. I felt the presence of God. Good. That was for you. That's not what you sit around and talk about. What you sit around and talk about is what the word says. Because the word that was given to us, that's all they did. They taught their children, who taught their children, who taught their children. And now we're getting tainted, but we're coming back. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 4. This is, how, this is how serious God is about this. Deuteronomy 4. This is Moses, man. He's coming right from the throne. Um, he says, but watch out. Be careful never to forget. What did he say? What did Moses say? God said, be careful never to forget what you yourselves have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live. Yeah, go back and reflect. Talk about it. Sit there for a half an hour and imagine what it must have been like to watch billions of gallons of water go whoosh, just like that. Imagine what it was like when the element of no food and no water in a desert could not overcome God. That for 40 years, they drank, they ate, they never got sick, their, their shoes never wore out, they never needed to go to the dentist, they never needed a doctor, they, their clothes didn't wear out. Come, imagine, imagine the world putting you in the most remote place to fail, and God's going, I got this. See, when you reflect on those moments like that, then you can go look at your present day and go, same God, same God. Why, why do I, like, I got I to gotta go talk to you. I gotta, tell me that I'm going to be okay. I'm not going to tell you you're going to be okay, but he says you're going to be okay because I don't know if you're going to be okay because if you don't follow this, you're not going to be okay. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, those people try to rebel that and go, no, but I'm okay. I can do this on my own. You can do it on your own for a moment because you have the ability to do great things. God made you that way. But when the, when the rubber hits the road, when you're in the middle of a desert, when it's impossible to drink water because there isn't any, when it's impossible to eat food because there isn't any, and he provides it, not one year, not two years, but 40? 40 years? When you come up against a body of water and you're being attack, attacked by the most elite soldiers that the Egyptian army has, and God says, watch this, Moses, lift your staff. You know, you know it. It even came with the music. Dun da 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 dun da 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 dun da 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 da. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know how Cecil B. the Mill got a hold of that copyright, but man, it really made the movie. So he says, but watch out and be careful never to forget what you yourselves have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live to pass them on to your children and to your grandchildren. Again, in verse 10, he says, never forget the day when you stood before the Lord, your God on Mount Sinai, where he told me, um, summon the people before me. I will personally instruct them, and then they will learn to fear me along, uh, as long as they live, and they will teach their children to fear me too. The word fear, what he was saying, is your children, your, your children will reverence me. They will honor me. They will respect me. They will know that I'm real. Three million Jews don't eat consecrate yourself, don't have sexual relationships, prepare yourself, walk before the mountain, and as you stand around the mountain, you'll hear the voice of God. No humans on the planet have heard that like they have heard it, and all of a sudden, out of the fiery furnace comes a thundering voice that scared the living daylights out of the people and said, fine, you talk to Moses, we believe. You say, well, why doesn't God do that again? He did it once. Greater to those who believe without seeing but you're not even going to believe without seeing because you're trying to believe without knowing. And if you don't know, what do you have? You can't even activate your faith because you don't know where to act. I'm going to be okay. Why are you going to be okay? Because the word, I just believe that, no, no, find it in here and give it back to God. He, he loves when you give him his word back. Hey, Lord, you said fear not. I'm with you. So with me, where are you? That's what David used to say. Where are you in the midst of all my enemies trying to destroy me? And then a verse later, he's like, thank you for victoriously defe defeating. Because he first told God, where are you? Because you promised. And then he told God how wonderful he was. But we kind of eliminate all of the instructions and just kind of go with the respect of the emotion. I felt God, that's good enough. No, it's not good enough. Trust me. Trust me, your emotions will lie to you. How many people say, I believe God spoke to me? Sometimes if you're thinking on something for so long, you'll think it's God. It's not God. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But what you have to do is go, what did he really say? What did he really say? 
because the word said something different. I love it when people come to me and God said this. I'm like, he couldn't have said that. That goes against his word. But I believe he said it. Well, go ahead and believe it. It's not him. People are afraid. Oh, I'm not going to say it if God spoke to you. Who am I to say he didn't speak to you? Because the word said it didn't speak to you. You see what I'm saying? When you, when you balance it all off of the word of God, then you have the truth constantly. Keep listening, keep listening. So if God expected us to teach the children, how much more does he want the salvation message of forgiveness and healing and deliverance taught to our children? How much more does he want children to forgive instead of vengeance, an eye for an eye? How much more does he want people, children to forgive? How much more does he want young people to forgive? How much more does he want young people to understand how much he honors them and how much he loves them and how much he created them perfection? And who are we as parents and are we and adults that have surroundings around young people? Are we telling them how magnificent they are? Are we telling them this or are they going off their own belief? and one parent lives here and one parent lives there and that's fine because that happens sometimes but somebody has to pour into these children keeping them from putting guns to their head do you understand what I'm trying to tell you and adults as well you if you don't start now you're not going to make it and if you haven't started now, start now wherever your kids are they could be 20 30 years old start right now you're still the patriarch of that family amen you still have the opportunity to raise them so we should be embarrassed we should be embarrassed as a body of believers. What have we done? We, we love to just gain for ourselves, but it's not until you give does God bless. It's greater to give than to receive. It's not just in the offerings. It's what you have. It's the knowledge you have. Come on, somebody. So we are more worried about, put that up there. We are more worried about fitting in this world and not offending than building a secure future for our children. Wow. What are we doing? What, what are we doing? Oh, God help me. Deuteronomy 6, 4. I'm using every, and I am, this is only not all the scriptures. This is just enough to keep us going today. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I am giving you today. We spoke on this before. Verse 70 says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're home and when you're in the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to the hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Don't stop talking about this. People, we have a job to do. World that's watching out there, I'm sorry. If you're feeling like you're nobody and that you have nothing in your life, that's because we have failed. We're so geared to ourself and what can God fix me, fix me. You're not broken. You're just misled. Quit asking God to fix perfection and jump back into what he told you you were. Amen? Get back to the word of God. Watch God change you. Get, yeah, we need, to, we need to yearn for his presence. We need to live in his presence. But without the word of God, his presence can go astray. Now, people, they're gonna, they'll fight me on that. No, the presence of God will lead you. Come on, man. You have no bounds. You, no, you have no structure, no foundation to understand what to do with this presence. Amen? A Bugatti will get you from A to B, but if you open it up, it'll kill you because it's fast and you have to know how to drive it. So the same thing with your life. God says, take the presence of me. Take the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Line it up with the direction of the book and watch what happens to your life because he honors it when you do this. Somebody say amen. Now, don't get me wrong. I can preach on that, and there could be a but and a what and all that stuff. Yeah, God's presence can come in and change somebody who never heard the word of God before and tell them all about it. But when you have the word of God, you need to take that presence of his Holy Spirit and engage it with the word of God and watch what he'll do for you. Okay, so now keep going, Joe. How can we teach what God commanded us if we ourselves have lost the childlike ways about us? We're adults, man. We got it together. If not, we'll make it work. That ain't good enough for me. You don't make it work. God has already given you what works. Just follow that. So Matthew 18 says, Jesus called, I love this, I just love this. Jesus called a little one, and a little one in the, in the, um, the Aramaic and the Greek, it talks about a toddler, a boy or a girl. But it's a toddler, it's a very little one. To his side, and he said to them, learn this well. 
Now he's teaching to the children. He's ministering to the children. Unless you dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with a wide open wonder of a child, you will never be able to enter in. How can you teach somebody where you've never been? Wait, I don't understand that, Joe. Jesus puts a little kid on his lap, a little toddler on his lap, and he talks to the people. Unless you become as pure as this little child, you will never be able to enter in to the glory of my kingdom. Not so much, not even eternal, but on earth as well. So he's trying to say, you have got to dramatically change your way of what you think is right and go back to the original floor plan and blueprints and build the building the way it was instructed. That's you. You say, but Joe, I'm trying to do that. Stay in the word. Every Christian has, I just don't know, how many, don't, don't raise your hands, and if you're out there watching, you know, raise your hand to yourself because no one can see you. But if you're reading the Bible, you, you get up every single day, you read this word. Find a chapter and read the whole chapter. Even if it's a, even, I mean, if, if it's a chapter a day, read the whole book, rather. And if you're reading the book, it's like, I don't have a clue what this means. Just read it. Just read it. Now you're giving the Holy Spirit something to teach you. Amen? But if you'll just get me out of this mess, I'm in God, please. Get me out of this mess. Go to the word. Go to the word. I can teach you if you got something going here. I can turn your boat if it's in the water. Amen? I can steer the plane if it's flying. Just get in the water. So now, we become like this child, but in Luke 10, 27, which I spoke about during our, our Ecclesia night, but I'm going to take this on a different one. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. So now they're feeling the experience of using his name. But Jesus says, they're marveled at the power and the glory of God. The, 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 the apostles are marveled at this incredible power. Can you imagine demons? In Jesus' name, come out, and all of a sudden the person's fine. In Jesus' name, arise and walk. In Jesus' name, be healed. I mean, these apostles were freaking out. They're like, oh my, this is so different than chapter 9 when we were getting ourselves beat up by demons. So now they understand it. But watch now in verse 18, it says, yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Jesus said. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them, and nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. We talked about that before. They're registered in heaven. Your names are registered in heaven, not the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb's book of life is for when you die. Your names are written. Come on in. Well done, my good and faithful servant. This is Satan always is over the atmosphere of the world. He's hovering in this little earth is the heaven, the heaven right above the earth like this. In other words, darkness covers the earth. Greater darkness covers the people. Who is darkness? Satan. Where does he hover? Around the earth, around the people. But he's powerless. <laughs> Jesus knows that, but do you? So he says, when you start to do what I tell you to do, what ends up happening is your names are written in heaven. You take the authoritative position, and you collapse the already defeated Satan. So that's a little understanding right there. But it says, <clears throat> I love what it says right here, verse 21. At that same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. He was filled. Something made him happy. Watch this. <clears throat> and he said, oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Thank you for hiding these things from those who think of themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the, to the what? To the what? To the very thing that we abandon. We abandon childlikeness in ourselves and we abandon our children. Hmm. Oh, I give them a home and I buy them clothes. Okay, teach them this right here. Watch what happens. So, hiding What? The power and the glory of God. So many people have not seen the power and the glory of God because they're not moving in the childlike way of living. We're trying to live, we're trying to put God in a box where we understand him. So keep listening now. It says right here, it says, yes, Father, it pleased you to do this this way. <laughs> My Father has entrusted everything to me, and no one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one will truly know the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal. Who does the Son choose to reveal all of God's glory to? Let me help you. The childlike. 
Not the wise man, not the one who looks highly of himself. That's what God Jesus, he said right here. He says, thank you for those who think of themselves wise and clever. They don't get to see the power. They don't get to see the glory. It's only to the childlike who sit before God and say, I don't know how to get myself out of this mess, but your word says I'm going to get out, so I believe. I'm getting up and I'm having a good day. That's childlike thinking right there. Because most people are like, you know what, you're going to, I mean, I remember, my God. I remember my, when I was growing up, people would come to me and they go, you got three daughters, Joe. <laughs> yeah, man, I do. And you're going to have three weddings to pay for. And I said, okay. But, you know, when they're like four and three and one, you don't think about weddings. Not to mention the fact that every one of my kids decided to have my, my wife's teeth and my teeth. They're big teeth and little mouth. So their, their, they, their teeth looked like this. The one, they were all over the place. This one was up here. This one was back here. So guess what? My children needed braces. All of them needed braces on their teeth. Now, here we have a unex, unexpected uh, expense that came out. Did you, did you prepare for that? No. Why? I, I just, I don't know. I didn't have, I, in order to do what I did, I couldn't make much money, so I just had to use the money to live on. Okay, so fine. I just trusted God. I remember telling my wife. She goes, <laughs> Nikki needs braces now too, and then Jenna, and I'm probably going to need them again, my wife said. I said, that's okay. When it's your turn, God will tell me where to go get the fish. And every single time my wife or my kids needed braces, this is exactly what happened. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good. He would tell me to go fishing. I would go do some job, and I don't know, public speaking or entertaining kids somewhere, and they would pay me the entire sum of the braces. And it wasn't cheap. You all know if you put braces on your kids. So all my kids go through braces. Then my wife needs braces, and she gets put through braces, and they're all paid for. Then all of a sudden, they decide they, they, decide they want to get married. So Dominique goes ahead and gets married, and we got to pay for the wedding, so we pay for the wedding. It's like, where we can get the money for the wedding? I don't know. God, you provided for the braces. Here comes the wedding. Because it's the childlike faith that says, you do what I call you to do. You teach what I teach you to teach to the people. You keep this word in you, in front of you, and from you. And I will take care of all the other incidents that come in life. And sure enough, that wedding was paid for before it actually happened. Amen? So then after Dominique gets married, a couple of years later, Jenna wants to get married. And then Jenna wants to get married, and while she's getting married, we're preparing for her wedding, and then all of a sudden, God's like, I'm going to really show you who I am, Joe. I'm going to have Nikki get married, too, in the same six months later. So Jenna's going to get married, and six months later, Nikki's going to get married. Now, I was not a really good steward of my money because I didn't save for these weddings because I didn't have anything to save. Somebody say amen. Amen. I was too busy teaching children in those days. And when you teach children, they pay you in used lifesavers. And you can't say no to them. You just have to do it. So now they get married. When, when Jen, the final wedding was Nikki, when she, when she was on her house and she, she walked out our house door for the last time, a married wife, I said, and stay out. <laughs> I didn't do that. But all I know is my wife sat down and we looked at all the expenses. And we go, how did he do this? How did he do this? My God. Some people worry about all this junk, but yet they don't even teach what fixes it. Why? Because we're too busy trying to fit into society. There's nothing wrong with financial planning. Don't get me wrong. But when you absolutely have no money to do it, you know, you either call Dave Ramsey or, or you just trust God. I don't know what to tell you. But I'm just trying to say that he is a God who doesn't let you down. So where was I? Why did you all interrupt me like that? I already said that, so let me, let me finish this up. Ready? Okay. He only reveals himself to the childlike. Remember that. Then, when they alone have, he turned, he turned to his disciples, I'm in verse 23, and he said, blessed are the eyes that see what you have seen. I tell you, many prophets and kings long to see what you see, but they didn't see it, and they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Mm. We will today begin to hear when we become the, we, we, we look at it as the child and the childlike. When we see it as the child and the childlike, we will hear everything that God tells us to see. When we can look at the original blueprints, when we can look at St. Patrick's Day as not leprechauns 
green beer, getting blitzed, getting drunk, and playing with shamrocks and wishing and rubbing them for good luck. And we can get back to the fact that one man was in prison, he went back, and he saved the nation. When we can look at it that way, we will begin to walk in that. When we look at the Bible in that way, we will begin to walk in that. When you start looking at Easter as the resurrected Jesus instead of bunnies that deliver eggs for false eggs, then you will say, he is my God. He is who I am. Don't teach your kids about bunnies and eggs and leprechauns and shamrocks. Teach them about the word of God because when the wall falls down on them, the bunny's not going to save them. Amen? Yeah, man. So Isaiah, Isaiah 11, the very last uh, thing I'm going to say, it says the calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion and a child will lead them all. The child they were talking about was Jesus. But the power within Jesus is in you. So not only will Jesus, the child, lead them, but the child like Jesus in you will lead. So you all are, Jesus said, I will do, you will do greater than me because I will be in you. So he's looking for us to take and absorb all that he is, to receive him as a child, to become childlike again, to erase all the memories that are in our life, to erase what mom did to us and what dad did to us and dad left and mom was drunk and, and so forth and so on and I don't even know my parents and they're there and it's their fault and stop complaining and stop blaming and get back to the word of God and say I'm your child you're my dad feed me and I'll receive it like a child and then when you do you watch what he does because his word doesn't fail mom and dad can say try Jesus says do Amen? You try. It works or it doesn't work. You do and it'll work all the time. Every time he will take you on the journey. Stop worrying and let's take our children back. Stop worrying and let's become childlike again because we will succeed. We will not be a nation that fails. Somebody say amen. amen. So you are not meant to follow. None of you on this, on this planet, those watching on TV right now, you're not meant to follow. You are meant to lead. We are teaching our children to follow the trend, the good or the bad. When Isaiah 43, 19 says, I will do a new thing, God said through, through, through Isaiah. He said, I will do a new thing. If God's going to do a new thing, then what is the new thing? It's the word of God. You said, no, no, he's going to do a new thing. No, listen to what I'm trying to tell you. A new thing based on, in Isaiah, the law versus Jesus resurrected Jesus. So he's now the power in you. But nothing in here is old. It's all new. Joe, I don't understand what you're saying. If it's the Old Testament, if Jesus was 2019 years ago, that's considered old. It's only considered old when you read this as a history book. But when you read it as a newsflash, it's happening right now. Amen? Everything he said and says and will say is happening right now. It's a news flash. Every time you obey the word of God, you are doing the new thing. Every time you understand the resurrected son of God, you are opening up a childlike faith, doing the new thing that he has for you. It's not the world's thing. It's the new thing. Somebody say amen. So when you hold on to this and you understand this, then you must become like a child and the children must take priority over everything in your life. Even if you don't have children, then you need to become childlike again. I'm going to give you these five things. That was number one. Number two, financial survival is not the first on the list. Spiritual survival is what you teach them first. Not financial survival. Number three, academics, education is not first on your lists. Spiritual education is. Climbing, number four, climbing the ladder of success is not what you teach your children first. Sitting at the feet of Jesus is. Number five, quitting because things don't go your way is not an option. Knowing him and taking the authority he gave you is. Lest you become like a child, you will never take the authority. You'll just quote it. But when you become like a child and you have that childlike faith, then you take the authority of God in this word and this word is in you and you take the authority and you change the atmosphere that is around you instead of letting the atmosphere change you. Don't buy the lies. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't need to add to you. He's never going to take away from you. He's never going to love you anymore. He made you perfect. It's the world that changes you. Stop buying the lie. So, Worship team, make your way back on up here. This is what I want to say. This Resurrection Sunday, God has instructed me. I traveled around the world, and I used to preach in churches. And because I did so much stuff for children, when I say children, I'm talking 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So many children that when I would come to a church, 
They would all bring their children. If it was a small church, there'd be a handful of children. If it was a large church, there could be 200 kids in that, in that service. You say, oh my God, how distracting was that? It wasn't distracting because we preached the word of God. We didn't try to entertain them. Amen? So this Resurrection Sunday, God said, I am beginning a new thing at this church. He told this to me before the Christmas season, but I'm only, it's, it, I said, I'm going to wait until you tell me what to do. And he said, on Resurrection Sunday, he will have the, we will have a family service in here. This is going to be a huge Resurrection Sunday for us because I don't want you to just bring people. I want you to bring kids in your neighborhood. Bring the children. Bring all the children. And we're going to minister the gospel to the young and the old alike, just like Jesus did right here, taking the young and teaching the old, you say, oh, that's going to be a kiddie service. Why don't you just come and find out? Why don't you just come and find out what do you consider a kiddie service? You will be as blessed, if not more, than the children. The only thing different is they're going to get it before you will because they're children. So come childlike. So I want you to stand to your feet, if you would, for me right now. And I want you to start praying. Those that are watching online, if you're watching and you live within 5,000 miles of Orlando. <laughs> Prepare to take a journey here, Resurrection Sunday, and bring your children. Do you know what happens in a church when the kids minister with daddy and mom? Do you know it was never supposed to be separated? How do you know that, Joe? Because if it was separated when Jesus was teaching, they, the kids would have been in children's church. But they weren't. They were with mom and dad. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, I would love to do that again. Tuesday night, I love it. All the kids sit right here. Right here. Don't hear a word out of them. They just, they got their notes. They're ready. They're taking notes. The kids are taking notes. Except the four-year-old. He's drawing pictures. Can we become childlike right now, church? Those that are watching online, would you please ask the Lord to help you become like a child again? What do I have to do? First of all, you have to ask Jesus into your life because he's the only one that can help you become childlike. Well, I don't believe in that. You don't believe in it because somebody told you their ways and made you disbelieve, but Jesus never changed. Lest you become like a child, you'll never fully enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I'm not asking you. I'm begging you. I'm begging you. Just ask him into your life right now. How do I do that, Joe? Joe? Jesus, I need a Savior, and that's you. Help me. Come to me. Begin to work in me. Open my eyes to see more of you. I'm going to take the first step, Jesus, by saying yes to you and no to the world. And I know you will absorb me, and I know you will take me in, and I know you'll hold me, and I know you'll teach me, because that's what the Word said. If you just ask that Jesus into your life right now, you need to start reading this book. If you don't have a Bible, go get one. If you absolutely can't afford a Bible, you just write us. We'll give you one. Go find a church if you live within 5,000 miles of here and you can't make it here. That was a joke. How could you joke at a time like this? Come on. Laughter does a body good like medicine. Don't you take your medicine while you're sick? So laugh a little. Find a church that preaches the gospel. Find a church that doesn't try to blend with the world. Find a church that worships and adores him. Find a church that says, the word of God says, therefore it is. And watch your life grow. Gather with the assembly. Gather with people that will help you in Jesus' name. We love you if you're watching online. Bye-bye. See you next week.